Matt Wallace is a producer, engineer, and musician with over 30 years in the industry, working with the likes of Maroon 5, The Replacements, Faith No More, OAR, and Paul Westerberg. Lately, Matt's been working extensively on new and catalog mixing in Atmos from his studio in Van Nuys, California. In this interview, he takes us through the technical and artistic aspects of Atmos mixing, his production philosophy, working with Faith No More and The Replacements, and why making records isn't about the gear. Hi, Matt Wallace. How you doing? I've been very, very good, actually. Uh, yeah, just gotten busier these days, uh, thanks right. to uh, mainly an investment in time, energy, and money to get into this Atmos stuff going on, so doing a lot of stuff like that. So, How'd you get into the Atmos thing? My friend Will Kennedy, who used to do a bunch of engineering for me over the years, and he kind of went off on his own. Then he and I kind of reconnected about nine months ago, and he was the one who said, you know, we should do this Atmos thing, and I was pretty against it early on. I, I, I felt that anytime you have, like, 10,000 watts of power and 100 speakers, it's going to sound great no matter what. And when they folded it down to this like little box, I remember being like, oh, that doesn't sound very good. But things have gotten better with the rendering after the mix portion of things. And Will and I put together this room that sounds really, really good. Uh, part of it is because we were both so diligent and anal about everything. He and his dad did all the calculations. I did all the build out of where the speakers go. And because all of our speakers are freestanding, Nothing's attached to the room. There's no real coupling with the room, which is mm. which we were very, very fortunate. We did it very yeah. cheaply, but we also were really particular about how we put things together. And we we're also very, very lucky because our room has been tuned by Dolby and our speakers are off by half a millisecond, which is incredible. We had a, like, we had a laser measuring thing and we nailed it. And it just sounds like, sounds good. You know? what, what, right. How did you choose what kind of speakers you wanted? Well, it was all Will's uh, idea. We, he had a couple different companies he liked, but ultimately we ended up with this company called Cali, K-A-L-I. And uh, the main dude from Cali used to work at JBL, uh, a guy named Charles. And he and a couple of other people, this guy, uh, Nate, started their own company. And what they do is they have made these speakers that sound really good for the money. And uh, to use Will's phrase, they punch much higher than their weight. They really just sound great. And our room, after being tuned by Dolby, we did mixes and we went to Capitol Studio C, which has about a $150,000 in speakers. They have the, you know, the PMC, top of the line, everything. And it's really incredible how our mixes sounded very, very similar. Oh, wow. And which has never happened in the old days of analog two inch tape. You know, you take your mix to other rooms, you go, what the hell happened? You know, so things were always so kind of floaty and nothing was really kind of anchored in bedrock. Everything was just kind of ambiguous and amorphous. And now our mix sounds just like our mix over there. It's like, okay, now we're talking. And I think that's the idea that when you mix stuff, ideally when people have their rooms tuned, they'll hear it and it'll sound kind of like it sounds like in the room. So to a novice, like when you, I mean, this is a new art form, so there's no real yeah. templates yes. to work off of. So that must be a thrill to kind of not have to, A, worry about that or consider it, but yeah. just make it, I guess you're in there just making it sound great to yourself, right? Basically, yeah. And the thing that I was not aware of, because I never really did any 5.1 mixing, but the thing about 5.1 is you've got left, center, right, and you have the two in the rear. And basically, those are your only options of where you put sound. Now with Atmos, left, center, right, two kind of wides, and then two in the back, and then the ones above. The thing about Atmos, it's uh, you can put things anywhere. It's called object mixing, where you can put it at any point in space. And the renderer will calculate how many speakers have to put so much energy into it. You, you can put the, the voice right here, or you can put it here, or you can put it behind you. And so this object mixing really opens up, basically you're mixing in a sphere, and you can put sound anywhere within that sphere. And I, I heard that for real at uh, Blackbird when I listened to Rocket Man. I, you, yeah. I mean, literally the ooze were like right behind you, but not like left, right, in the back. They were like yeah. sitting on your shoulders. It was Absolutely. really very moving. Very, very moving. Well, is the idea also for it to translate the headphones in some way? Yeah. Well, I think because basically most people will ultimately be hearing on headphones. So to answer your question in a roundabout way, Listening in our room, it sounds amazing. Off the Dolby Atmos renderer on uh, Apple iPod Maxes, it sounds almost like the same thing. It's really amazing because they, it, there's basically a binaural fold down, and you can set it. You can set the parameters so that certain things are in front, middle, and back. And who, so, who sets that? Uh, we can do that. Uh, actually, Will's the guy who does most of that. I know about it, but he does the real work. So once you 
plan everything. When you get ready to go to buy Nora, you can say, okay, this group of uh, left, center, right, we're going to put in the front. The stuff on the side, we're going to put in the middle of our binaural and then some stuff. So you have, you have front, middle, and rear in your binaural. Right. And so we set those parameters. So the good news is if you listen on Amazon or Tidal, all of those parameters that Will and I put in our mix, you put on your headphones, you go, there you go. Great. The prob- The problem is, is on Apple Music, for whatever reason, they strip away a lot of those things we put in there and they kind of mess with the mix. And it may- has made it such that when we're mixing stuff, we have to basically mix it, send it to our iPhones, listen in our iPod Pros or Maxes, make notes because inevitably it's going to have more reverb than we thought. Some things will be messed. So we have to kind of tailor our mix to Apple for the time wow. being. Wow. Uh, I think I think Apple, because Apple's using I think it's an older version for whatever reason of the Atmos thing. And they, and they call it spatial audio so they don't have to use, I guess, Dolby's trademark. Uh, anyway, eventually I hope they're going to come around. I guess one of the reasons they do it, they have this like uh, head tracking thing where if you're listening to your mix and you turn your head to the left, the vocal will go here and the band will go there. So I think it's a really cool thing for people who are into like gaming and maybe they want to hear that in their mixing. But for me, it drives me crazy. Right. But I think the reason that their fold down of the binaural sounds weird is because it, it's incorporating that kind of tracking thing. Uh, but again, you go to Amazon, you go to Tidal, you don't need any special headphones. You plug in, it's like, oh. Oh, wow. Like- yeah, it sounds like an Apple mix. But with Apple, you need the AirPod Pro or the AirPod Maxes. You need the Apple crap to get going. Anyway, eventually that might change. So right. I can I can listen to Atmos, your Atmos mixes on these headphones, and that's it. There's you, nothing special. Nothing about special. That. If wow. you go to if you go to Amazon or Tidal, you, what you hear it will be a pretty good rendition of what happens on the room. Be pretty good. Whereas on Apple Music, oh my God, it's been so frustrating. All we have a group of about 14 or 15 like other Atmos mixers and we meet every month or two and just talk about the frustrations and like getting Apple to kind of get caught up I think with a couple of things so anyway who else is part of your crew like uh, myself Will Kennedy uh, Dave Way a guy named uh, Steve Jenowick uh, Sylvia Massey is now part of it um, great Bar- Brad Wood I mean there's a bunch oh, cool. of really but it's I have to say it's it's the first time in about a decade that I feel like there's a sense of community yeah. because it's kind of like the wild west we're all trying to figure out how what you know what are the standards for delivering how do you guys get over this uh, challenge how do you get over that so and we actually have a little group where we text each other questions like dudes I'm doing this thing how do we do this or that so people are are incredibly supportive I have to right. say it's really been beautiful and, and Brad Woods the one who got Will and I involved he really held our hand and said Here's what you guys got to do. So people are really, really, truly supportive. It's really but, nice. But John, here's the the thing about the headphones is that's where this can go a little further than the 5.1 thing, right? And the quad that we grew up listening to, where if you didn't have it set up in your house perfectly, yes. Yes. it was kind of a waste. And right. now it, the fact that you can actually go to a pair of stereo headphones, and I'm sure that'll yeah. evolve. And, yes. and like Matt's saying, everyone will get a little bit more together and sort of the method for how to do it will become a little bit more uniform is really the shot that it's yeah. going to have to go into the 3D world. And Absolutely, yeah. Uh, I forgot to mention, Andrew Sheps is part of our group as well. Nice. So he's, he's he's like the OG. He and Steve Jenniker are the OG. But I think you're absolutely right about, about the fact that you don't need a system to hear it. And I think because most people tend to be relatively mobile when they're listening to music, I think this is just a more immersive way to kind of experience music. It feels like it surrounds you. You don't need anything special other than a pair of headphones. And it's it's really a nice way to kind of get into this incredible technology. And, and are you mostly mixing records that you've made in the past that you're familiar no. with? Or are no, you doing... no, no, no. We're actually doing frontline stuff right now, too. We're doing this artist named Ondara, who was initially from uh, – Kenya, I think it is, and now he lives in the States, but he's an African singer-songwriter. So we're actually starting to do frontline stuff because Apple has made it known that anybody who wants any prominence on Apple Music, you have to deliver with uh, with Atmos or spatial audio mixes. Wow. wow! So we're doing a lot of catalog stuff because people want catalog. You know, yeah. There's a lot of hits out there. But we're doing this frontline stuff right now. Uh, we just did this guy, uh, Chico Curlyhead, this incredibly talented 19-year-old kind of urban rapper singer guy that goes between spanish and english and the way they produce the tracks are stunning with a lot of cool delays and and reverbs and stuff and and so we are doing frontline stuff as well we just actually got another frontline record uh delivered to us so right now we're probably 50 50 between um 
catalog and frontline. And I'm really excited about the frontline stuff because that's the kind of the future leaning stuff, you know. And the catalog stuff, do you try to match the record and then go yes. from there? Yes. Uh, that's one of the things that I think got us the gigs is that after Will and I had put together the system, uh, we mixed some, uh, I, I found the multitracks for This Love, Maroons 5's This Love, then I did Faith No More's Epic. So we basically built these things and we played it to these folks at Rhino and Warner Brothers. And they basically, I didn't realize it was a test question until after the fact, but but Suzanne Savage from Rhino said, you know, so what's your approach when you're mixing catalog material? And we both basically said the the doctor's quote, which is do no harm. Right. And so the idea is you have something and just because you can spread it out everywhere, and also we can make every single song a roller coaster ride with stuff swirling around, and we can really make the technology shine. And we said, listen, the whole goal is to serve the songs. And uh, and so once we said that, that, that's when Suzanne said, okay, we got work for you. So then we got the B-52s. Well, that stuff was multi-tracks. So a lot of the more you know, frontline stuff, we get stems, which is great. Right. But back in the era of B-52s or Faith No More, no one made stems. Right. right. So Will and I had to very, very, very carefully – reconstruct that mix with all of the effects, reverbs, panning, EQ, everything. Did you start in stereo? And, yes. And yes. rebuild it? Right. Yes. Because what we do is when we're doing catalog stuff, we put up the original stereo mix that's re released. Yeah. And we carefully, carefully rebuild the mix. You know, we did that with Kid Rock's uh, Bao De Ba and All Summer Long. Uh, we did a Daniel Powder track. We did a bunch of uh, Jason Mraz stuff. Those things, we, you know, we had to kind of build the stereo. Not the Mraz stuff, but everything else, we had to build the stereo. And then we go, okay, now let's spread it out. And again, novice here. But yep. so, so you listen, it's mixed for Atmos, but the listener can't listen in stereo. It's in it's in Atmos and that's it's it. It's in Atmos. There is a way that I think Apple will do this thing where they can fold it back from Atmos down to stereo, but it really doesn't sound good. First of all, most of the stereo mixes sound great. And the right. other thing is that people are really, really familiar with them. And yeah. they really like them. So that's one of the reasons why it takes such care. We really, really listen carefully and we really try to do the best we can so that when they hear it, we hope that they don't go, what the hell? You know, we just want to sound like a bigger, better version of what they originally intended 30 years ago. Say you're going in to make a new record. Yes. Is it somewhere in the back of your mind now that this is going to live in Atmos? Or, or do you just make the record like you always have and then deal with that later? Well, for me, I just think we're at the point right now where I, I think at least us older people who are used to stereo are going to probably just start with making a stereo record and you'll do all your regular overdubs. And once you get to the mixing stage, then you'll decide where you want to spread it out. Now, I think younger people, if I was an 18 or 20 year old person working in my bedroom, and I could listen with, you know, binaural Atmos, I would, might start writing and creating with that in mind, maybe. Right. Uh, but for me, honestly, I don't know how valuable that is because we're really trying to have a great song with great performances, first and foremost. Right. And so once that's done, then you can put it wherever the hell you want. And right. I just don't think that the technology is necessary to uh, adhere to it because I don't think it, I don't think it adds anything other than the, the potential for slightly more emotional content when you listen, where you can hear all the details and the nuances. What, what's your favorite of the most recent you've done, if you could talk about it? Well, um, we re remixed uh, Faith in the Moors Epic, and because I initially right. produced that, we are like, we can do whatever we want. We don't have to adhere to anyone else's standards. And oh right. my God, that thing is crushing. And, yeah. and it's interesting how some bands like B-52s don't, particularly lend themselves too much. I mean, they, they, it works in Atmos, but the Faith the More stuff, because it was so heavy and we had, you know, four tracks of guitars and multiple right. guitar harmonies, it, it really opens up really beautifully in that kind of situation. So uh, it is interesting. Some of the stuff really, you know, lends itself to Atmos and some stuff is like, eh, yeah, sounds better, but, you know, it's not. Yeah. It just sounds like, you know, wider, hyper stereo. And the other stuff, you feel like you're right in the middle of a band and it's super powerful. And again, I was reticent and now i'm like okay this stuff sounds right. amazing i wanted to ask you about that faith no more record i'm just curious do you record that analog yes which one the, the one that had epic on it yeah yeah this was back in that was back in uh the 88 so i don't I, I think that was the very nascent days of pro Tools. so yeah it was all uh yeah it was actually actually analog 24 track and technically so, 23 track because one track for simpty it wasn't even 48 you didn't link machines amazing and yeah. you had that many tracks of guitars anyway. Yeah, we did it. Yeah, it was right. uh, 
Yeah, it was a challenge to pull that off. You know, we, we, I think for me, here's the, the thing. I think that 24 track, while it has its limitations, I think it's almost essential to have those things to make great records because I've, I've discussed that record before with many people. And the thing that is, is we had one Marshall half stack. We had one Gibson Flying V. We had one Gibson Grabber bass with a PV guitar amp and one drum kit and one Emacs. So it wasn't like, let's try this guitar or this amp. We only had one of each. Right. And to me, the limitations made it so we had to find ways to be creative within that. And so, yeah, and same thing with 24 tracks. It's like, look, if you can't make a great song on 24 tracks, then you really should go back to the drawing board. And I really yep. feel that way. Yep. And one of the disadvantages to Pro Tools is that you have infinite tracks and yeah. you can have infinite layers in each of those tracks. And so then you just don't make any decisions. And what happens is people almost postpone mixing until mixing. Whereas when you're a 24 track, like, okay, I'm going to combine some stuff to these tracks. I'm going to print it with compression or reverb or whatever you're doing. Like, and yeah. there's the sound. And so when you mix, you could just kind of put faders up and like, there yeah. it is. So, you know, I, I mix some like Queen stuff. I did some remixing of, you know, I've remixed other stuff. And you, it's interesting how many of those things were alive, like Tie Your Mother Down. Like yeah. Freddie is singing with the band. Like, right. There it is, you know? And I think that when the technology was limited, the musicianship had to be much better because it was almost yeah. like a photograph of a moment. Whereas nowadays we can kind of detail paint every, you know, it's like multiple mono. You record one thing at a time, put it in time, put it in tune, next one. And, and in the old days you had to just let it out, you know? Anyway. Yeah. When did you make the transition from analog to digital? The only memory I have of that is probably right around 2000 when I, 2001 when I did the Maroon 5 record. That's the only conscious moment where I remember it was like, okay, we're making a record on uh, digital. And I remember this because at the time our budget was limited and 750 megabytes of storage was seven hundred and fifty dollars. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. I remember that. <laughs> and so I never made a I never made a backup safety of that album because I just didn't have the money and and so um, and so that was right around the time where I remember I remember it was so such the transition that we I remember we tracked the initial drums and band on twenty four track analog and we dumped it to Pro Tools and then worked from there on out. As it turned out, I ended up we ended up erasing or messing with the drums. We wanted to make an, an urban record. And then I had to re-record the drums in the mixing studio. So ultimately, all that stuff was, in fact, recorded on digital Pro Tools. Wow. Yeah. yeah. That's amazing. You, you know, you bring up an interesting point about archiving records. You know, all the records that we made on tape exist somewhere. But there was a bunch of years where I was, I had that same issue of hard drives were so expensive. We started backing up to some sort of a tape format, Right. Yes. D so DDS3 or whatever it was called, I unfortunately have a whole box of records that exist on these little tapes that you can't really find a DDS3 machine without an right. ultra-wide SCSI port on an old computer. So I, I have no way of restoring these records at yeah, this moment, tough. you know? It's interesting you bring up that uh, tape back because that's how we backed up the Maroon 5 record. And I remember the frustration. So you work a 10 or 12 hour day. It's like, okay, now we're going to back up. And I remember you'd go there and you would go like, you know, 15, 30, 45 minutes, you know, 50 minutes. And like, you know, almost done. And right at the very end, it's like, oh, error. Like, oh, seriously? Yeah. Error. That's, Start oh, all wow. over again. I didn't have that problem. I was still busy beta testing the analog machines all across Manhattan. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I was like the last guy in fucking Pro Tools. It was great. <laughs> oh, ridiculous. You might have come late to it, but at least when you got to it, it sounded better. Mm -hmm. Because when we all yes. made that early transition, it really didn't sound great. It doesn't sound anywhere near as good as it sounds now, at least in my opinion. What was the improvement? Just the, the uh, bit? Yeah, sample rate conversion. Sample. And yeah. just... Basic analog to digital conversion. Yeah. Right, right. I agree I agree with you on a technical level that, that the early sound of Pro Tools was left a lot to be desired. Certainly didn't sound like analog tape. My only argument against that is that most civilians wouldn't know the difference. Yeah, if you right. played them, they wouldn't know. And when I listen back to um, Motley Crue's uh, Dr. Feelgood, which was done like 16-bit, it sounds amazing. Wow, and it yeah. rocks like a motherfucker. Yeah. And, and in my mind, it's like it's 16-bit. But when I put up, I go... Sounds good to me. Yeah. Well, you know what I mean? We, yeah, we all sort of, uh, there's also analog where the theory was, oh, we're going to 24, 2 inch at 30 IPS. That's going to sound better than 16 at 15. And that turned out to still be 
a, a little bit of a joke on all of us that right. yeah right yeah. what was the first studio you ever walked into huh well there there was a guy oh shoot uh I think his name was Dave Denning. He was a guy that was a guitar player for uh, Steve Miller, and he had a 16-track MM1000 studio probably when I was like 19 or so, and it was in his in his house, and he had uh, done a bunch of recordings there, and that was the first time I was in a studio like, oh, my God, this is amazing. I mean, prior to that, I had my own four-track studio in my parents' garage, but that's right. not a real studio. But that was the first right. one I think I remember walking into and going, oh, this is how they do what they do. So that was really, really so fascinating. Actually- as a kid, this is what you wanted to do. Huh? I mean, you grew up wanting to, or at least being enthusiastic yeah. about it. To start at the beginning, when I was 13, I was in bands and I was uh, playing guitar. We were playing like Black Sabbath stuff and Deep Purple and things like that. So I was into like heavy rock, but my ear was always really tuned to radio, pop radio. And so to me, I've always kind of pushed and pulled between those two extremes. And so I was the nerdy guy that I built like a synthesizer with some you know, resistors and stuff like that. And interestingly, back in 1973, I built a wireless guitar out of two green G.I. Joe walkie-talkies. Wow. Wow. So I envisioned this idea. (laughs) And and wireless guitars didn't exist at that time. And I remember I was like, what if I take this thing apart and I plug it in and we played it with my friend Alan's dad's stereo in the living room. We were in his bedroom playing and the music was coming out there. I was like, this is really cool. So if I were smart, I could have been really wealthy developing that stuff. But I, you know, anyway. So I was the nerdy guy that would record stuff on cassettes or I built a little four track. Ultimately built an eight track studio in my parents' garage with a Tascam 80-8. And that's where I recorded a band called Sharp Young Men that became Faith No Man that became Faith No More. So they the Amazing. rhythm section recorded in my parents' suburban garage back in 82. So they're, they're Bay Area. You were Bay yeah. Area? Yeah, Bay Area guy before moving to L.A. Yep. Ah, yeah, fantastic. those those first two or three Faith No More records really rocked my world, but a lot of people's worlds. And I, yeah. I got to tell you... Those records still hold up in an amazing way. They still well, sound great. You. Like, such a great band. They were so yeah. much fun to watch. Yes. I'm sure you had a blast in the studio with them. Yeah. One of the things that I uh, I probably am not very popular with with some of my peers, and that is I feel that 80 to 85% of the sound comes from the musicians. I think it's vocal cords and fingertips. That's where it really comes from. Us as engineer producers try to capture as well as we can try not to get in the way, and we try to get that last 10 to 15% that really makes it sound like a record. But it really comes from great songs with great performances, you know. Like a band like Faith No More, those guys, I mean, we kind of grew up together learning, uh, and they generated this kind of music and this this vibration and this sound and this energy that was so incredible that I just tried to capture and and, and do the best I could to kind of realize their vision, you know. They were playing as a live band already. Oh, yeah, they were right. absolutely a live band. So, they were live, live, live. Right, because then there's also the making of records where people aren't playing live. Yeah, yeah. No, Faith No More, I recorded them in my parents' garage. We did a little seven-inch single, and then they kind of, they were Faith No Man. They became Faith No More. I, I actually did their live sound at their first gig as a new iteration at a place called On Broadway in San Francisco, and I did live sound, so I was always kind of vacillating back and forth between the two. But for me, it was always about musicians that, play live and all my eight track stuff i did like 40 records on eight track it was all bands that also by the way you had to be live because in the studio all the drums went to two tracks you know one track for bass and and so it was like you guys got to play you know that's it so so then you you go on at a certain point and make records with the replacements yes and that had to be a trip oh my god what a what a hell ride that was (laughs) <laughs> oh, I can only imagine. I mean, we uh, we have a guy local down here in Raleigh who's the brother of one of the tour managers who wrote a book about them. Yes. And uh, I can only imagine yeah. those guys had to be, like, totally wild, right? I mean... Yeah, that was really... Um, that was a really, really difficult record to make. And, you know, it, of all the records I've made in my career, if I ever went back and had to do it again, that's probably a record I would reconsider uh, doing because it was so difficult... They had initially started the record with a guy named Tony Berg, and he spent a couple weeks with them, and he he was on his way to making a fine record with them. He either was fired or quit. Then they hired, I guess Scott Litt was online to do the record, but they duct taped him to a chair, and he passed on it. But all the time, I knew the folks at Warner Bros. I kept saying, I'd like to work with the replacements. And they'd say, well, Tony Berg's doing it. Okay, call up. Hey, uh, I want to work with the replacements. Well, Scott Litt's doing it. Then finally, one day, they're like, yeah, you're the one because nobody else wants to do it. So I had a, <laughs> I had a phone call with Paul and we started working. But yeah, they were, 
you know, they're kind of hellions. Um, yeah. They want to test you all the time. Right. Uh, and you have to kind of, you know, their, their mentality is like, you know, you're either with us or against us kind of thing. And, and, you know, they like to drink and, you know, I mean, you know, one of my craziest nights was with the replacements and Tom Waits in the studio from midnight to like six in the morning, you know, I oh mean, my God. with people, you know, doing blow and drinking and Tommy, you know, would during tracking splinter to bass guitar and, you know, the, you know, Slim threatened to beat me up a number of times. I mean, it was just a really, so, oh, and by the way, I had an engineer, this guy, John Beverly Jones, Monday through Thursday, he walked in Thursday and, and he was supposed to be there at noon. He came in around three o'clock and I could tell by the, when he walked in with his eyes, he goes, I quit. It was like, oh, so I ended up producing and engineering that thing. And it was just really, really yeah. hard. Yeah. I mean, really, really talented guys. Paul's a great writer. And interestingly, that record was mixed by Chris Stord Algae. And I had friends who hated the sound of that record and, and blamed me for ruining the replacements because oh, it just sounded God. so, it sounded so slick. Right. Uh, well, about three, four years ago, I finally was able to mix that record the way I initially intended. Warner Brothers was kind enough to give me a chance to mix it the way we intended. They found my, my rough mixes of that record and people were like, oh my God, this is how this record should sound. And that was a real joy to, make it sound the way we always wanted to yeah. sound. So that was really, that was a once in a career, once in a lifetime opportunity. Super grateful for that. Well, you know, it brings to light uh, the real question of, like you were talking before about, you know, 80% or 85% of it is mm. what comes from the players and the songs and the compositions and the arrangements. Yeah. But you were put in a position as a producer where you you had to make it happen. You had to let it happen or make it happen or sidestep. Yes. Yes. And were you able to contribute creatively? Did they allow that? Or did you have to be careful of how you went about doing that? Yes, I had to be very, very careful. Um, you know, one of the complaints, like Slim, who was their newest guitar player, who kind of acted like a bit of a bulldog because he was the new guy. He had to kind of be more brusque and things like that. And he would just say things like, you know, I'm older than you and you don't know shit, you know, all these kind of things to me. And so I, it, I have to say I really learned to – build their trust in me over time. And I think once they realize that I was in it to get their best record, they finally kind of relaxed a little bit, but I had to really kind of prove myself, you know, early on that. And they sometimes again and again and again, they finally, I think I honestly, the truth of the matter is I think I wore them down because I was going to quit every single day for the first two weeks. I was going to ask you that. Did you have any every, moments of every single day? I was like, fuck this. I am not up for this at all. I used to I would go home to my girlfriend at the time and go, I'm out. And subsequently I talked to the, Folks at Warner Brothers, Michael Hill was our A and R guy, and they were all betting like you're not going to make it, you know. But I just I hung in there. But you know what I did? Um, after two weeks of a hell ride, I decided to myself, and I remember consciously saying, "I'm going to make this record, even if all these guys die in the process. I will make this fucking record." And once I got there, it didn't matter. I was like, right. "I don't care. I will make this record." And, and you know, there were, I mean, there were so many times where you know, you know, they're breaking things. I mean. One of the stories is that we tracked it at Cherokee in their A room. It was a Trident A range uh, console. Uh, and then we went to their, their B or C room. We did all the overdubs there. And so I, I had this, I had to make master reels, right? So you had to cut all the masters onto your two inch reels. Well, their whole thing is that they don't want any outtakes to be heard by anybody because they don't want anybody to hear them when they're drunk and they're messed up. So I, I made these master reels and they had our, our assistant uh, take the reels and listen. And he goes, okay, we want to wipe these. So he, they took a bulk eraser, all this, those things. And they put them up on the tape machine. And they could hear like channels 12 and 13. You could hear a little faint bit of music. They go, well, listen, we want to wipe these. So they had our engineer put them on the, re, on the machines and put them in record and wipe them. So great. But they were grabbing all kinds of reels to do that. And I'm not exaggerating. I literally made a stack of like four or five two-inch tapes. And I sat on the master's. I sat on the masters while they were gra going around me grabbing stuff and just erasing stuff. So fortunately, I saved those. But unfortunately, there's a song called We Know the Night that was a gorgeous track. We tried multiple times to get the right vibe, and that song got lost. They went to um, Paisley Park in uh, Minneapolis, and, uh, and you know, like our first day, we walk in, they have an API console. They had just re refurbished, they had just kind of recapped it, that kind of thing. And we walk in the studio, and Paul's got a tumbler of. Uh, Jack Daniels, and he spills Jack Daniels across 16 channels of the faders. We just walked in, oh, and God. you know the, the, the studio tech walks in, and you could just see his face just turns white. He's like, 
you know, you guys were the first ones to use this console. So, of course, they had to, like, you know, pull out 16 channels, you know, two buckets of eight, and they had to clean them up and put it back in. But, you know, and then, you know, they would threaten me because I would, uh, you know, say, hey, I'm going to, you know, I, I, here's the thing. They would blame the drummer, Chris, for being late or lagging. But it was just the guitars and the bass leaning so far right. forward. So, so what I would do is when the guys were gone and after we recorded the drums, I would take – I did this back in L.A. and also in Paisley Park. I would take a rhythm guitar track, run it through a delay, and then print it in time on another track. And then I could gotcha. wipe that track. I would take the bass guitar, you know, bar by bar, just, okay, yeah, he's 20 milliseconds ahead, you know. And, and I remember Slim going, if you fuck with our guitars, I'm going to kill you. You know, I'm going to punch you kind of thing. But, you know, at Paisley Park, they'd leave at 8 o'clock at night. I would just go clean that shit up and made it really super solid. But that's, be, you know, if I had digital, I could have done it other ways. But, yeah. you know, I had to kind of run it through delays and set things back in time. And, of course, it's a generation later, but there you go, you know. They never knew. Right. They never, they, knew. they never knew, but they threatened, but they never knew, you know. Right. But the, all they know is that their record sounded a little more professional than they probably wanted to. Yeah. You know, a, a, as a big fan of theirs in New York, they would come to New York, whatever, and wherever they went, they fucked up. Everyone hate. I mean, everyone wanted to go to see them because we loved the records and we, yes. we knew how great they were, but everyone hated them. You'd yes. go to Seabees. They were one of the only bands, I think, at Seabees that were, they wouldn't let them in. It was like, <laughs> how crazy <laughs> is that? You know, yeah, people for CDs walking, not to let them in. That's... I mean, people are walking in with guns and bats, and those yeah. guys were too crazy. But I think they were, weren't they uh, barred from SNL? I think they, oh yeah, I think they did. They were supposed to not sing a, a lyric that was that, the, yeah. And, they, and, and they, they were told never to come back. And, yeah, yeah, yeah and, yeah. and I think Maxwell's, and there were all these places yeah. where, at least the community of musicians that I was in, there was always a rumor that they came to town and, they had a fight with someone or someone punched oh, yeah. someone out and yeah yeah i saw them i mean i saw them in berkeley california and it was the one literally one of the worst shows i've ever seen in my entire career i walked in there and i was so excited i was like such a fan like oh these guys are great and so they start off i go wow this is the replacements and it just went south they just got more and more drunk they started yeah. playing cover songs they started butchering them and i literally walked out of the show yeah. i was like fuck this i'm out of here and i left yeah. You know, I still was a fan of what Paul had to say, but oh my God, it was so irritating. Well, but their whole thing is like if one guy kind of stumbles or starts going south, they all just pile on and they all just kind of go down, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's frustrating, you know, when those people that are so talented, but, and you know, part of the thing is that burr in their saddle, the thing that's the, the grain of sand in the oyster that irritates it can make beautiful, incredible, compelling, right. resonant art, but also just can make dealing with those folks sometimes so profoundly difficult you know just like oh man come on like why do you keep shooting yourself in the foot here come on let's yeah. let's pull together you know it's very frustrating but i would imagine that experience not intentionally but that experience from that point on you grew a muscle and a oh. callus that allowed you to walk in because yeah. because at the end of the day even though you are a producer there are feelings and there's taste involved you know yeah. We're supposed yeah. to be there because we have some, but if you're constantly being squashed down, yeah. and and belittled, oh yeah, that's a very difficult situation to be in. And it is, I, I give yeah. you a lot of credit for finishing that out. And yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, a lot of people didn't think I was going to do it. Yeah, I think for me, the the uh, being a producer is very difficult, and there are times. The times that are most difficult to me are, say, if you're in the middle of a song and you have to wrap it up at the end of the day and the song doesn't sound very good yet. It's, it's kind of in pieces. And you have to basically leave and tell them, okay, we'll see you tomorrow. You know, we'll, we'll pick up. And to have that kind of confidence that the next day you're going to pull something out of the hat and you're going to make it happen. And, and you have to kind of lead the band. Even though it's their record, you have to kind of like lead them. And to me, it's just such a difficult thing. And I'd had a couple of records where I realized – if I have to describe to a lay person, what does a producer do? They go, what does a record producer do? I go, here's what it is. Okay. The three of us are on, our, on an island. It's a nice enough island. It's a little island. It's got some coconut trees and, and there's a little bit of water and it's, everything's fine. So as the producer, I'm like, hey, there's, you know, there's a bridge that goes off up into the mist from the island. And I'm like, you know, we should go up that, that bridge. You, know, you guys are like, um, I don't know, man, this, this island's kind of totally fine. I go, yeah, I know, but... I think there's something better. You guys are like, you know, describe it. I go, I can't tell you what it looks like, but I think it's better. So we go up on this bridge. It's a rickety bridge. And we're going up there, and it starts, the wind starts swaying. 
And you guys are like, Matt, man, let's turn around and go back to our island. It was perfectly fine. I'm like, come on, guys, let's go up there. So we're going up there, and now the pieces of the bridge are falling apart. And there's water underneath there, and it's windy. And, and you guys are like, fuck you, Matt, we're going back. I'm like, come on. And so we finally get through, and there's a nicer island. And now there's papayas, and there's watermelon and pineapple. And you guys are going, this is great. And, you know, and, you're, and you're like, why did you tell us it was like this? I go, and I'd say, look, I didn't know it was going to be like this, but I knew it was better where we, from where we were coming from. Right. And and to me, the producer is the guy who's going to grab everybody by the hand right. while things are going all over the place. And you're going to just steadfastly go, come on, there's something better over here. Let's keep going. You know, and people are yelling at you and like, this song sounds totally fine. You know, it's like, no, actually, it can be much, much better. And I've had like this band OAR. They had a song that was in pieces for two or three days. And we would leave and people were like, dude, what's up? And that became a song called This Town because I said, I want one that's going to be played at like – games you know ball games and sure enough i pushed through they were all upset at me and then after a few days this town it was used on espn college basketball it yeah. was used all over the place that's exactly what i wanted but again when they had they had a song and they're like it sounds fine i go yeah it's fine but i think it could be much much better and to me being a producer is the confidence to walk out of the studio at night close the door and go i'll see you tomorrow and they leave, and now you're going, what the fuck am I going to do tomorrow? I have no idea, you know? You're just like, ah. You know, and you walk in, you just pull shit out of your ass, you go, yeah. how about this? You know, and then you make yeah. it happen. You know, and that's really the producer. You have to be super intuitive, yeah. super tuned in. And, you know, it's interesting. I really learned that lesson when I did Paul Westerberg's first solo record, right. which was also his first sober record. Mm. And that's where I really learned to be a producer because – He's so mercurial. I had to be a micro step ahead of someone who didn't quite know where they were going. Mm. And my one of my right. most smartest moments. So he, he he picked a band. We had Susan Rogers, who's engineering. Great. We're, we're at RPM Studios. We we track this song, knocking on mine. He loves it. It sounds like the faces, and he loves it. I go to the back to the studio the next day at noon. Hey man, I guess it must be early. No one's here, you know, at the studio. Paul walks in. I go, where's everybody? He goes, oh, I fired them all. I'm like, what? So one, he picked the band and he picked the engineer. Two, he fired them without even telling me. Hey, I don't like the vibe. So uh, what do you mean? Oh, yeah, Susan's gone. The band's gone. So now I'm producing and engineering and it's Paul and I. And I hear him. I walk in the bathroom to pee and he's playing this song in his 12 string. And fortunately, I brought my case of crap and I had a Fostex X15 cassette deck. I plugged it, hooked it all, put a cassette, and I, I walked in there, hit record, and he, he did a song, uh, Even Here We Are. He played on the acoustic. He did a bunch of overdubs. I transferred it to 24-track tape, put some bass on it, boom. But I had to be a hair ahead of him, yeah. knowing what it is he wanted to capture it. And that's, well, that's what a real producer does is you just – you basically have to learn to breathe when things are really tense and trust your gut and listen peripherally. And you, not what they're saying in the center of the room, but what they're saying peripherally. And sometimes the quietest person in the band says the most astute things. And you go, okay, here's where we're going to go. And so with Paul, I just had to be a step ahead of him. Boom, we're good to go. Yeah. We were at uh, Coast Recorders uh, doing a song called Silver Naked Ladies. And the, you know, I could hear the band. We got, it was our second take. I knew it was, it was happening. I put a boom microphone in the control while I'm tracking with a uh, U47. He walks in. He listens. He goes, I love it. I go, you ready to see? He goes, yeah. I, so here he's got a U47. I turn the monitors all the way up. I hit record, and he's grabbing the U47, and he does the vocal. Great. Now, technically, the right. wrong way to do it. But vibe-wise, that was the right version. Right. Right. And that was one of those moments where he looked at me like, because he knows that's not the right way to do it. And I go, come on, man. And I, but I hit record. I go, you're going. So he, he couldn't like discuss it with me. And so he just grabs it and he sings that vocal. And I think that was the thing where I was a step ahead of him. And he's like, oh, you're all in. You don't care about, you don't care about audio. You just want the vibe. And that's what we did. And to me, right. those are the moments where you have to go, I'm all in, man. I will meet you and I will raise the stakes. And, and then they start trusting you. Yeah. You this know? guy's and, legit. Yeah, yeah because, because because you're you're actually in a way crazier than they are because you know the <laughs> rules of audio, but you're like, yeah. oh fuck the rules, man. Fuck Here's the, the rules. microphone, and then they look at you like, oh, you you want to do that? Then we're because that's what they want. They want to break the rules, and if you break right. them even further, they go, all right, we're 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 in with this guy. He's he's in. We're doing it. <laughs> 
But, you know, you, your description, two things. One, your description of the tropical island and all that. I might ask you if I can. Yeah. My, my mother's 98 years old. If you can, I've been trying to tell her what I've been doing for the last 40 years. Uh -huh. I might have you call her and tell, and maybe you could throw John's mother in with that too. Because she has yeah. told me no less than 20 times. She said the same thing to me again. I hope someday you win a Grammy so you can retire. <laughs> uh. And literally, I try to explain to her that one has nothing to do with the other. Yeah. But she has yeah. in her mind my yeah, only yeah. validity in what I do in yeah. my career is to win that goddamn Grammy. Yeah, so. it can help. It can help with record sales, but it doesn't. You know, that's you bring up a really interesting point um, about his mother. Is, well, yeah. First of all, I owe her forty bucks. That's all right. the story. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the thing that was really fascinating to me is when Maroon 5 hit and they got a Grammy for, um, I don't think it was like, it was like, it wasn't new, uh, newest band, but it was, I think it was like best duo or rock duo with a singer, whatever it was. Anyway, they won a Grammy. And I remember at the time I thought, oh, I, I made it. This is really fantastic. But it was really interesting that people were not pounding on my door. And I remember talking to my manager, Frank McDonough, going, why be part of a band that wins a Grammy if it doesn't really seem to translate to be getting more gigs. Whereas when Faith the More hit with Epic, people found my home number and were calling me. Right. System of a Down and Corn and all these bands, they found me because that was such a cool, groundbreaking right. band. Absolutely. And, and that created work. Whereas the Maroon 5, I remember just looking at my manager like, what's the point? I don't even know why I've got this hit record. It's selling millions and it just doesn't seem to translate to like more gigs. It was really weird. When did you make the move to Los Angeles? And it, well, in 1988, uh, January 4th, 1988, I moved to LA. Uh, and I, you know, I think for me, I got tired of making demos of bands in the Bay Area that would ultimately get signed to a, a major label. Then they would hire, like, this happened on a couple of times where uh, this band I worked with got signed to Aeros. So like, okay, you're going to produce the record. Like, yes, you know, because I made these amazing demos. They go, oh, well, they're going to have this other guy produce it, but you'll engineer it. Like, okay, that's fine. And they go, oh, well, the producer's got his own engineer, so you're not going to work on the record. Right. So that happened enough times. I go, you know, I'm either going to move to L.A. and make it, make a living at this or I'm going to quit and do, go do something else. And I figured I'd be down here for two years, you know, make it and then move to the Bay Area. Well, that was 33 years ago, so that didn't happen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is, you know? there a, is there a music scene in the Bay Area at this point? I'm sure there is. I mean, I haven't yeah. been up there. There used to be a really – incredibly vibrant one when I lived up there. Uh, Primus and Faith No More. And I mean, there's a bunch of really cool, and then ultimately Metallica. And, you know, right. there's a bunch of really yeah. cool bands that did yeah. come out of there. You know, I mean, you can go back to like Jefferson Starship, Jefferson Airplane, right. you know, The Grateful Dead, all that kind of yeah. stuff. But uh, Journey. Uh, yeah. So there there was a really, really Santana. vibrant scene. Santana, yeah. There's yeah. a lot that came out of there for, for a while there. But I just, uh, I moved down because I just, I just didn't want to make any more demos for bands that kept getting signed. Yeah. And I just like, well, I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm done. I'm going to move to LA and do it. So I moved down and just started pushing hard. But ultimately, I, I, I got success with the band I was working with before. It was with Faith No More. I moved to LA and in '88, I went back to the Bay Area in like September of '88 and recorded and did the real thing, which became their big record. And so, when when amazing. you got to LA, did you did you build a studio or were you working no, in? What I did is. Um, uh, in '87, I did a song. I did a song for this band called the New Monkeys, which was like a revitalization of the Monkeys for Warner Brothers. And um, and miraculously, that song became the single from that record. And I got to be friends with Lenny Worker from Warner Brothers, Roberta Peterson, and Stephen Baker. And I have to say, one of the things that I miss today that I had in the olden days was a real sense of community and Warner brothers really right. took me under their wing. They saw me as a young producer and I did that, the new monkeys thing. I think they wanted to hire me, but I was whatever, probably too left of center. So they worked out a deal with slash records. And I, and I got hired by slash records uh, to be a staff producer, a uh, and R person and slash had an upstreaming deal where they could, you know, their successful stuff would go from slash to Warner brothers, which is ultimately what happened with uh, faith no more. So it was really interesting to really find that sense of community, connect with those people, and they were the ones that I pestered to get the replacements gig. That, that's right. interesting that you mentioned Lenny Waronka and Warner Brothers, because that was sort of a known thing that they let you fail. You know, they yes. didn't just drop you after one record. No, they had a real good re artist development reputation. They, they were great. You know, Lenny Waronka. 
I, when we walked in, I had the replacements. I had Paul Westerberg with me, and I think it was maybe Slim, and I went to meet with the Lenny Worker, and you know, we played him some of the uh, kind of the rough mixes and stuff like that. I remember we were asking him what his thoughts were, and I thought he was going to say, you know, make a pop record with singles. And he just said, hey, what you guys are doing sounds really good. I want you to make the very best replacements record you possibly can. Amazing. And that's all he yeah. said. And there was never any pressure to make, you know, pop music. And I remember people thinking that the replacements were becoming pop with that album because of the pressure from the label. But what it was was internal pressure. Paul and I wanted to make the biggest, best, most successful, accessible replacement circuit. It came from him and I. We wanted we wanted to be kind of still raw and gritty, but we wanted to maybe make it to radio. You know, and, and it's really fascinating where Lenny pulled back and didn't push that direction. He just said, make a great record. And we on our own pushed for yeah. more pop yeah. stuff. And that's also the most successful record. And so we were very fortunate that Warner Bros. You know, pushed as hard as they could. You know, just to go back to the OAR thing you were talking about before, where you said it was like two or three days you had to put this track together and rebuild it. And they were not into it. Yeah. And that you've known over time that it was a successful thing that you did or a productive yeah. thing for them. Yes. Did they ever come to realize that? Like, Yeah, I think they did. That record, I was actually kind of fired from it twice. The first time I did a uh, this one song called All Sides, I, I did kind of a sublime version of OAR and the A&R guy hated it. So I wasn't going to make the record. So I guess they, they so anyway, I was fired. And then their manager called me while I was producing another record and uh, said, okay, we're ready to work. And, I, and they sent me the songs. I go, listen, I don't want to be a dick, but I don't think you have the, the breakthrough track yet. You know? And he got really mad at me. And he said, okay, well, then that's it. We're going to find somebody else. I said, okay, fine. I understand. Well, three weeks later, they come back around, and they had this song called Shattered that they'd written with Greg uh, Nadell, I think it was his name. And Shattered was their biggest song they ever had. They had tremendous uh, like on, on AAA radio, they're like, like, you know, the top five AAA radio. And they ended up uh, headlining Madison Square Garden that year. And that was, again, I, I didn't want to be a dick, but I just said, you got to write some better songs. And, and I was absolutely right where we got that song. We also did This Town, which became used in all the ESPN, you know, college basketball. I mean, it was really, so it was really fortunate that we all were united right. in our kind of goals. Right. And it's, it's great that you have that musician standpoint anyway, right? Because you yeah. do also make, you've made records as a musician, correct? Yeah. Well, I yeah. have, I mean, I mean, I built my HX studio to make my own record. Uh, that was like an 82. So what are we like 40 years later? I've never made my own record. So it never happened. Okay. Uh, but, but I do know what, I mean, I play guitar and I play drums, but I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a remedial musician. I, I, you know, I'm not good enough to be a musician, but I'm good enough to be able to talk to people and say, right. here's what you got to do to get it, get it happening. And, and, um, and by the way, this is kind of a left turn, but I, one thing that was important to me during working with bands, whether it was, uh, you know, OAR or any band I've worked with, and actually with Maroon 5 too, is to sit down and spend 30% of rehearsal on acoustic guitars. Mm -hmm. Right. Because if you're in a room with a PA and you got a drum set going and some, some amps, everything's going to sound good. Right. But it's like, strip it down to acoustic guitar, do we have a song? And with Maroon 5, my biggest contribution was, I said, you guys got to write bridges. Because all their demos went verse, chorus, verse, chorus, and they would kind of just noodle out. And I said, you got to write bridges yeah. because I want, I want some classic songs that might be covered. And the bridges they wrote in those two weeks of pre-production are some of the most stunning parts of those songs right. where the songs really just lift up and go, oh my God, they're classic songs. And I pushed for that. And they even, when I run into them, they go, you're the guy who made us write those bridges. And it's like, yeah, because yeah, you needed bridges, you know? Yeah, I've said that. Um, a, fr a guy I know who I'd made two previous records with, um, and then they decided it was easy, so they were going to make the fifth record themselves. Right. And uh, in Williamsburg, he was like, I want to play some roughs. And I'm driving around, we're listening to the CD in the car. And after like the fourth song, I was like, you have any bridges on this record? <laughs> and he was like, fuck you, man. And I was like, what do you mean? You're playing me the thing for my opinion. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And it, it was true. I, I won't say the band, but literally they did that record themselves. It was underwhelming. But I will never forget the, the guy. Well, we saw you make the last two records, and you know it looked easy. And like, it's not easy. You bring but, up a great point. This is a really, really. This is a very for me. This is a, probably the most important point for me for the whole discussion about production. That is, if you're doing your job as a producer, nobody notices it. Yes, they just right. go, "Well, that was easy." I, I mean, we could right. do it. Like, like you say, "Oh, we saw what you did. We could do that." Okay. Well, here's the thing. 
They're missing the nuances when you talk to the bass player on the side with their everyone's hiring right. let you go, hey man, what if you played like this or that? Or or you you hum a, a melody line to the singer like and you and you go, you go, and you you mention the idea of something and as you know, as a producer, the best way for them to do things is if you plant the seed and two days later they think it's their idea, they go, We should right. put a bridge here. And and you don't right. go, by the way, that was my idea, because then you look like an asshole, then they won't do it. But if you plant seeds quietly, you walk away and just act like you're just kind of doing your thing. Great records are made that way because you're quietly you, maybe you do a bridge here and they might say, Fuck you, we don't want to do that. But then two days later they'll come to you and go, What do you think of this cool like B right. section? Or B right. and you go, Sounds great. Yeah. And you just stick it in there. Right. And so they, they don't realize that later on down the road with the, the, that you were the one who planted the seed that made that thing flourish. And that's yeah. something that bands don't realize that even the way you set the stage or have the room so that everyone's the vibe is mellow and people can do their best work, that's all that's production. Yeah. It's yeah. really all of Absolutely. it. Absolutely. I always find it interesting when you work with a band and and the record does become somewhat successful. Yes. How do you how what's your approach of following up like the next record? You know what I mean? Like, how do you focus on how to make a record that their fans really like, but are is a little more mature? You know what I mean? Like, do you mm -hmm. spend time thinking about that, or is it you just let it happen naturally? Well, I think about that, but, I, but uh, the only band... I mean, I've done, I've done two records with OAR. I did a number of records with Faith No More. I should have done another record with Maroon 5, and it's really interesting. In the olden days, if you had that kind of success... Just for pure superstition, they'd have you do another record right. just so that lightning might strike twice. But for whatever reason, I didn't do anything on that second record. So, uh, but, but, and with the replacements, I did one record with the band and then one solo record with Paul. Right. So it's really right. down to Faith No More and OER. And um, Faith No More, the real thing was super successful. But for me, I never liked the sound of that record. I remember when I listened to my car stereo and my home stereo, I just thought it sounded really bad, over compressed, too much high end. And it sounded so bad to me that when I came home from mastering it, I thought it sounded so bad that I called my mom and asked her how I should, can get into real estate. I just thought I just did wow. a crap job. Yeah. Jeez. I was like, man, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. Okay, so fast forward six months later, it comes across the, the TV speakers and radio. It sounded amazing. It, I mean, it was the right amount of compression in high EQ that it worked, but sonically, I didn't think it sounded good. So the Angel Dust, the record after that, I went against the grain much more low end, almost very, very little compression. And I really wanted to make a hi-fi sounding record. That was my own feeling about the sound of that record. Right. Well, without even talking to the band, that's what they wanted too. They wanted to distance themselves from that record because they don't want to be a rap metal band. So they right. went another direction. And I, as a rec uh, producer, engineer, mixer, wanted to also go more high fidelity, not make it sound like that other record. So that was a conscious decision to not replicate what we did. And I remember making that record, Angel Dust, you know, the label was just like, they said you should call it commercial suicide because they wanted wow. the real thing part two. And and to be fair, Angel Dust didn't sell as well in the United States, but it sold better overseas. But it's a groundbreaking record that influenced a bunch of bands. Right. Like that, the, the, Angel Dust influenced so, so, by far more more bands because it was so kind of such a weird album. And I remember I got that Kerrang! Uh, magazine that said, like, uh, most influential records of all time. And I remember it started in the 50s, thinking, maybe I've got a record in the 50s. Nope. Oh, maybe I got a record in the 40s. Nope. Once I get to the 30s and the 20s, I go, none of my records made it. That's fine. Right. Number one, Angel Dust. Most wow. Influ yeah. And, and all these bands just cited that record as, yeah. this is the record that we want to emulate. Uh, what Mike Patton did as a vocalist, everything that the band did, was very fearless and i think that's the real stuff you know yeah and i i i gotta say i really like him as a singer mike Patton, but yeah. i also like him as a person he uh -huh. is funny as fuck yes like his some yeah. of his videos he's and and even just as a as an artist he's so much like yeah. he's tough but he's also really fun. i don't know there's something super likable about him and there is something and, i mean he's yeah. such a interesting character you know so much character such a I don't know. Yep. I'd love yeah. to meet him at one point. Yeah, he's, he's super, super talented. Yeah, while making the real thing, you know, he was saying like, you want it all? And this like really adenoidal kind of like, yeah. you know, sophomoric, you know, voice, you know, and he was singing. and But then I'd stop the tape and he'd just sing these like ballads, like this huge, deep voice. I'm like, that, put, let's put that yeah. voice on Epic. And he's like, no, man, fuck you. I'm like, but, but. And, and, and that's the, our biggest fight was him singing in that nasally tone 
for so much of the uh, big portions of the record, especially Epic. And I kept saying, I want that full voice. No, no, no. And, and, and interestingly enough, he was correct because that nasally voice had a snotty, bratty right. attitude right. that was the right attitude for the track. And I was wrong by asking for this hi-fi, big, yeah. robust voice. He was absolutely on it. And I was wrong. Yeah. Oh, that's great. I mean, yeah. you can't be right, you know. No, no, no. No, he can't nailed be right it. all the time. Yeah, no, yeah, he was super, super right. And we yeah. thought about it too, but yeah. he was he was right. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. So, you know, um spending a lifetime in the studio working yep. with musicians and all that stuff. You have any hobbies outside of what you do? Oh, yes, I've got quite a few. Uh, one of my biggest ones is uh, I, uh, some partners and I uh, bought a property like nine months ago, and we got permits. We're adding 1,600 square foot to a uh, this house that we're putting 10-foot ceilings in. And what a lot of people don't realize is that uh, for the last month or so, from 7 a.m. to noon, I actually am doing construction. I'm hammering and sawing and putting up walls. Wow. And then I come over to the studio, I get clean up, and then I work at the studio from 1 to like 10 o'clock at night, which I did a few years ago, two years ago on another property where we redid this 6,000 square foot house and wow. remodel it. So yeah, I love doing that stuff. I'm into uh, construction, so I swing a hammer and I love being outdoors and, you know, doing stuff with tools and stuff Super. like that. So yeah, that's so my, it sounds almost like a sport. It's a workout. I mean, I'll tell you, man, swinging a hammer and all that stuff and carrying heavy piles of lumber uh, is really, uh, especially at my age, you know, I'm 62. So that's, you know, it's a little daunting, uh, but it's great though. I mean, it keeps me in shape and I, you know, I'm, I'm in, if I say these pictures, I'm like 14 feet up. You can see my feet standing on like on a two by six and I'm up there framing and doing stuff. And you can wow. see all the way down all the, so, I, but I love it. I love that kind of stuff. That's beautiful. Yeah. It's a good thing for guys who are sitting in chairs all day. Well, yeah. yes, because we tend to sit so much, which is really not good for us. Yeah. It's super important. Like I, I have to do some physical. Like if I yeah. wasn't doing construction, I'd be. I do some pretty rigorous hikes in the morning before going to the studio. Yeah, we, me and Stuart used to play hoops in, in the '90s a lot. Uh, like in the morning before our sessions, and with a bunch yeah. of musicians and stuff like yeah. that. Like you know, play for an hour. Yeah. Then go home, shower, go to the session. Yeah, yeah, well, it's exactly. really important. Yeah. For me. I, I'm not a big fan of having to go exercise. I don't like getting out of bed early. I don't like driving to the place. But I yeah. know that the moment I'm done exercising, I feel such clarity and I feel yeah. super mellow. And then I, I'm also more effective as a producer. Yeah. Like when people are, are – it's a rough time with people. I, I'm actually more centered to kind of go, okay, I hear what you're saying. Yeah. Let's let's talk about it or let's work on it tomorrow. I'm. It's more difficult for me to get angry or upset. Yeah. I mean right. that was part of my question was because it, it's one life. Whatever – we do when we're not at work hopefully has some sort of an effect yeah. as to how we deal with our work. And yeah. Uh, I think, it, I think that's such an important part of it yeah. because the more solid we are, then it, then people will can trust us more. Cause I know when I was more nervous, like 10, 15 years ago and I wasn't as stabilized, it would be easier to knock me off my center and I wouldn't trust my instincts and with my ideas. And nowadays I just feel like, here's my idea. Let's try it. And I feel much more uh, relaxed, and and I think people are more amenable to trying because I just seem like I know what the fuck I'm talking about. Yeah. And I learned a really great phrase from Stone Gossard. I'd done some, he, you know, he's in Pearl Jam. I'd done a project with him like 15 years ago, and he's really the thing I learned from him is he would say to a band or artist, he goes, "Yeah, I want to know what your thoughts are on this. You know, what are your thoughts about this? You know, a really disarming way to kind of just, hey, what do you think?" Uh, what are your thoughts about this part right here? You know, right. mm. and so that's something I, I use, you know, like to get people to kind of get involved and see what they're thinking. You know, before we wrap, is there anything that we that we missed that you would like to talk that we? Well, well the only thing that I would say that um, as much as it's important for us as engineers and mixers that we do rely on equipment, you know, and there's some equipment that we really uh, it's important to have. I think it's important to not uh, put too much stock in the equipment. Yeah. Okay, when I made the OAR record, I remember I did the shootout, and I had uh, my engineer put up all, like, I had some, like, really nice tube mics, all this stuff. I had all these mics put up, and I put up this MXL 990, made in China. For mm -hmm. $90, you get a large diaphragm microphone and a little pencil microphone. Pencil microphone was crap. wasn't worth anything. So we put up that, and I would have him label them A, B, C, D, and E. Because if you know there's a microphone called a Neumann, you're going to like it better or an AKG. Right. Did all these microphones. And I would listen back. I go, I like this microphone here. It was that stupid ass MXL 990. Wow. 
Now, to be fair, it was a large diaphragm with discrete electronics, but it was made in China. Yeah. And, and this happened again and again on records. I put it up there, and it was really frustrating. So I ended up using it quite a bit. Well, I remember one of my peers came in and go, oh, MXL 990, man, you know, made in China. How does it sound? I go, sounds great on the radio. So, OAR song, Sh- Shattered, was recorded on an MXL 990. Amazing. And it was their biggest selling song. And by the way, Chris Rodalzi mixed it. He didn't go, dude, what's the fuck with yeah, that uh, right. vocal? doesn't sound very good. What mic right. was that? It was like no questions. Like It just sounded great. And, you know, right. to your point about the equipment, I, I've had the exact opposite experience. One in mind where I was at a, a place called Alaire, which was up in what's like a beautiful right. Right. world-class studio. And right. the band that was in before me, as I'm, we're, tra- we're trading over, they play me what they just did, right? Right. And I'm going, holy fuck. This is not like, so the equipment doesn't do it, right? Because <laughs> it was really pretty bad. Gr- a great song. Yes. You know, with great well, transcendent. Record- yeah, and, and with and someone's passion when they record it, I don't care what yeah. microphone it's on. Oh, uh, I remember the first three records that U2 did, Bono had a handheld 58. Right. All the microphones they could have, yeah. he had a handheld 58. Those are fucking hit songs Yeah. yeah. that, that yeah. came across the radio. Handheld in the room. Yeah. yeah. Right on. Anyway, that's, cool. uh, that's a, I mean, that's <laughs> pretty, I mean, We're that's pretty you. spot on. The, awesome. On that note, yeah. Matt, yeah. it was really great. Yeah, it was really great talking to you. And thanks, we, really we look forward it. to. You know, I can't wait to hear all this Atmos stuff and it's uh, really all the cool. all the yeah. great work that you've done and thanks. the record, beautiful records you've made. Really, really guys, great, Matt. We'll see you down the road, my man. <laughs> Take right. care, you guys. Bye. 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 Be sure to check out Matt's new Atmos mixes of classic Faith No More songs, released June seventeenth on Rhino Warner Music. They're featured in our title playlist of the week, which you can find on Matt's episode page at gearclubpodcast.com and also on Apple and Amazon Music streaming services. Me and Stewie want to thank all you gear clubbers for listening to this crazy podcast we do. If you can, leave a review on iTunes. It really makes a difference. And don't be shy. We love hearing from you guys on the social media at Gear Club Podcast. Don't forget to go to gearclubpodcast.com for Spotify playlists, links and photos for the episodes, and my favorite hot sauce of the month.